Welcome to episode 12 of More Than Just Maps. I'm your host, Ollie Powers. This podcast was created with the intent to help anyone in the GIS field get from where they are now to where they want to be, be that your first job, a career move, or just improving your GIS game overall. On today's episode, I conclude my interview with Brandy Rank. We talk about servant leadership and the difference between good and bad management. We also dive into some universal truths in the workplace and the importance of being aware of yourself, including your positives and negatives. And finally, we discuss how GIS departments are key in governmental organizations, be that helping IT department transition to 100% remote work or acting as bridges between siloed groups. All right, welcome back to the second part of my interview with Brandy. Um, so Brandy, on uh, the first section we were talking about um, your history and just kind of transitioning from different roles within GIS, specifically going from like a technical to a management role and just how it's a completely different skill set. One of the things you had mentioned earlier was how you're continuously trying to improve yourself and change yourself. Um, and you mentioned that you've read a lot of books. So what, uh, what are the kind of books that you're reading these days? Right now, for those of you listening in 2057, uh, we are in a global <laughs> pandemic. <laughs> so <Minor> I detail. <laughs> say that again. I'm sorry. Minor detail. Minor detail. I am reading like two books a week and um, none of them are improving me personally. <laughs> they are all <laughs> to forget about the fact that I am locked in my house and Colorado is on fire. <laughs> is this literally like California right now or? <laughs> yeah, it's really, really bad. The smoke, oh, yikes. Is, they're, they're asking everyone to stay inside and keep your windows closed. And I didn't realize there's that bad in, Cal in Colorado as well. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm not reading any books right now um, <laughs> on like <laughs> leadership or personal <laughs> development or yeah. anything like that. <laughs> That's okay. I mean, books are fun or it helps you keep sane. But I'm assuming you have read books on leadership and personal development then. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, what would be some of your recommendations? Yeah, I'm trying to think about the, the title. Um, it's, it was one of my favorite ones. And of course, I can't remember the title right now. It is, I'm going to look it up on my phone. Oh, no, I'm not. It's not here. I've read Candid Conversations, mm -hmm. um, which I'm sure everyone's heard. Um, I have I've not. read. <laughs> you haven't? No. Okay. I'm writing uh, it down right now. Yeah, I really like that one. I've read, I can't, I can't believe I can't remember the name of this. It is, it's written as a parable. The five dysfunctions of a team is the name of the book. And it's written like a, a parable and it talks about you through five dysfunctions of a team. Really easy to read. Really enjoyed that book. I tend to read more kind of articles because books on this subject tend to make me go to sleep. <laughs> I understand that. Not very highbrow in that sense. Mm -hmm. I, I read a lot. I really relate to servant leadership, mm -hmm. that concept. And um, I read article, a lot of articles from servant leaders. And that's kind of where I, you know, I don't like to subscribe to one little thing, but um, that's, that's kind of what resonated with me and what kind of made me say, yeah, that's, that's actually the kind of leader that I want to be. And, you know, I think a lot of us have had leaders that were terrible and we said, I'm never going to be like that person. And a lot of the leaders I had were like the opposite of servant leaders, right? It was all about them mm -hmm. and they took credit for my work and, you know, never gave me credit. And they, you know, kind of did all of those, you know, to me, unforgivable things and so that, that's kind of where I now, where I kind of um, keep my eyes open for articles and books. All right. I know what servant leadership is, but just in case people listening have never heard of this concept before, um, can you go a little bit into it and just explain and how you apply that in a GIS setting as well? Oh, yeah, sure. So servant leadership basically, um, in a nutshell, flips the hierarchy. So if you look at a triangle, in the typical kind of, um, I call it old school structure, you've got the CEO or the director or the manager at the top of the triangle, and then the power, you know, they're the pinnacle of the power, and then the people are kind of below them. 
Um, and it's very more control command dictate, you know, this is, I'm going to tell you what to do and then you're going to go do it. Whereas servant leadership flips the triangle and the people are at the top and you, the leader at the bottom, and your focus is to provide resources, support, and, and encouragement to your employees so that they can perform the best that they can. You know, I, I provide direction, of course, and I, I help set up our strategies and decide, make, I do make decisions like final priority, final prioritization, you know, I will do, there, there are certain things that I do, but the focus of how I treat my employees is more in that empowering them to do their best, their best work. Do you, did I describe that okay? Do you think, do you have anything to add? No, I think that's great. Okay. I like that a lot. Yeah, so how, how would you relate that to in, in a GIS context? Great example. I, I, well, hopefully this is a good example. So when I started at my new job, we kind of were talking about last podcast, um, people, the morale was really low. And there was kind of this sense of, that I got from my um, director and some of the other leadership in the department. Of course, you know, I had met with them and they kind of gave me their kind of rundown of things. And so, and then I was assessing the team and seeing where we were technically. And quite frankly, there was a bunch of stuff where I'm like, I felt like a broken record. I'm like, why aren't, why don't we have this? Why don't we do this? Probably the 27th time I said that, which is completely unproductive and you should never do that. Like, don't do what I did. That was wrong. One of my employees is like, again, Brandy, because we weren't allowed to. <laughs> and I was like, okay, you're right. I actually appreciate that you were a little frustrated with me because I, now I hear you. I'm going to stop saying that. I'm like, if you could do one thing, what would you want to do? And they told me and I was like, great, it's due on Friday. And they're like, what? I'm like, better go do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? So I did, they, they didn't need me to tell them what to do. They didn't, they're technically, they were fine. All they needed was permission. So, and when you're, Certainly. when you're going from like a shifting environment like that, where, Hey, they're, they're not allowed to do this. They're not allowed to do that. And suddenly the doors are opened. How does that affect them? Is it, is it like positive right from the beginning? Is it a slow start? Are they like, kind of like testing the waters first? How did that work? It completely depends on the person. So okay. one person was like, as quickly as he possibly could, he was at his desk doing it. Like, don't change your mind, lady, because I'm going to get this done. You know, like, finally, you're letting, I'm being allowed to use my skill. Um, another person, lots of fear, lots of anxiety, lots of, I don't know if I can do this. Like, I, you know, I always wanted to do this, but now that you're telling me, not only that I, I should, but I have to, and you gave me a due date with, like, actual work, like, ah! <laughs> And then someone else was like, well, you need to ask, you know, our boss, say our boss's name. And I would just, I just laughed and I was like, so let me get this straight. I need you to just assume that if I'm giving you direction, I've already passed it by our boss. Yeah. And, or if anyone's getting in trouble for doing it, because I don't ask, because it's not really my style, you know, in parentheses, I will take all the blame for it. And they were like, really? I'm like, yes, I will take all the blame. You are only doing what I am telling you to do. That is an insight into their previous culture. Yeah, and that They're, doesn't they, seem like a fun place to be. No, they were, get, they'd get in trouble. They'd get the, the their old boss, you know, somebody would throw them under the bus, you know? I'm like, that's not going to happen here. Yeah. If you're doing, if you're doing what I told you and everything we're doing is with positive, good, you know, intent and innovation and for the betterment of the city, then I will take all the heat for it. Yeah. It, it really depends on the people, you know? Mm -hmm. So betterment of the city, obviously right now we just mentioned COVID and you guys have the wildfires obviously. Um, but COVID in particular, since we're in the middle of a pandemic that has been raging on since March or earlier as, as they're kind of thinking it started, um, so what have you guys been doing to kind of help with that? I know a lot of, a lot of it has fallen on county governments, but I know some cities have gone and, and tried to do their best with helping out, um, whether that's creating dashboards or making things more accessible 
throughout different departments so they can still continue to either work remotely or make it easier for them to interact um, virtually with citizens. Is there anything um, that you guys have done? Yeah, yeah. So um, you're right. Our, our county and our um, uh, health district have really taken over the COVID related kind of reporting. Um, so we haven't really been involved directly in that kind of, you know, numbers and hospitals and that kind of thing. But there's been a lot of, as you mentioned, we have an entire workforce at the city, essentially one day we were in the office and the next day the entire city government is working remotely. Mm -hmm. So there was definitely conversations that had to be had because, you know, our IT department was caught blind. They didn't, and I'm not saying this in a critical way, they weren't ready for us to go 100% you know, working remotely. And a lot of it was the culture of the city was very much, at, if you're not at your desk, you're not working. I think that's pretty pervasive, especially in government. It's butts and chairs. <laughs> like yeah. they just want to see you there. And which is really not a good indicator of work being done. You can be at your desk and not doing anything. <laughs> I, can, I can tell you that I've actually done that. <laughs> <laughs> like every other person, you know, yeah. like, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's crazy. And so because there was culturally not a push for it, you know, why, why would IT get us ready? And then, um, so I just want to make sure I'm not sounding critical to them, but no one's ready for this. And then our servers are tested and our remote access is being tested and things are going down. And so we were able to do a couple things. We were able to kind of interestingly enough move some of our internal applications to our external servers because our internal systems were going down so much we were able to not make it public in the sense of we were sharing links but we were able to provide our employees links to external access applications that um, they're, they weren't going to go down, right? Because they're on the different server and you don't have to access it through the city. You don't have to be right. remote in or VPN. Yeah. And so, or be on we, the internet. Right. So it's kind of, it, it was, it was a more of a temporary change. Um, that's not obviously what way we wanted to do it, but it was like, okay, here we go. We got to How quickly done. were you guys able to do, to get that up and running? Oh, I mean, that was like, all, you know, Hey, GS developer, this is your one job. And it was, you know, a day, two days later, the, the, the key app or two were up, you know, it wasn't, it, we didn't move everything, but it was kind of okay. that key. Yeah. You make sure they can get their job done kind of thing. Um, so that was really, that was really great. They were very appreciative of that. It was a very stressful time as many people can attest to. So having your GIS map accessible was a small little thing that you could count on. Going through all this, and if we're thinking of people who are just coming out of school and entering the workforce for the first time, or, or they're changing careers and, and GIS is still new to them, how would you suggest to them, because they might be hearing things like, oh yeah, I just whipped this up in, in a day and we had the whole thing up and running. And I've heard many stories like that where people are just able to instantly get things going. And that's pretty intimidating when you're first getting into, into the industry. Um, what would you suggest for people to do to sharpen those skills? Because when you're first entering, you're, you're not at management level. You don't have to worry about your people skills. You, you want to work on your technical skills, but you're done with school. And I mean, school school's great for teaching you some basics, but it doesn't teach you everything you need to know. Um, right. So how would you, what would you suggest to people to, to learn those skills that you're going to need in a, in a real world environment? Are you talking about people who don't have a foot, a leg into a, to an opportunity right yes. now. Maybe. Okay. Yeah. I mean, the best thing you can do and, and it's just such an amazing resource is ArcGIS online. You know, you're not going to be able to do everything right because you're not going to have like an STE and an ArcGIS server and all these other, you know, enterprise systems that you're going to have in an organization. But I was going to say for those who are not familiar with SDE, that's just the enterprise version of Esri. <laughs> database yeah yeah so and yeah we are obviously an esri shop um so you know if you use arcgis online and, and it's it's free you don't have to pay to get an, an account and, and I, even I if you did want to pay if you get the home use it's only a hundred dollars so right. 
Right. Not that bad. <laughs> and I know during COVID they were doing a bunch of free deals and I don't know the details, but um, I would look into that as well. If people are interested, get into ArcGIS Online and learn every single app in there. Le you know, you can create features, you can publish services, you can create applications, you can create widgets. There's what, like 16... I don't know, maybe I'm exaggerating apps. So, you know, there's workforce, there's survey one, two, three, there's dash. Yeah, I think you're about right. We were actually looking at it today in the office. There's a bunch of apps in there. Yeah. Go learn them. You know, I mean, survey one, two, three is so easy and it's so powerful. There's so many applications we're developed. We just, we've created like seven applications in like the last six months, you know, you can have your friends, you know, fill out surveys and then based on their answers, which don't have to be true, create a dashboard. What's your favorite pizza or pizza topping? What's your, you know, just ask silly questions and, and learn how to create that dashboard. And, or even like find one that you like and try to recreate it if you yep. can't think of something. Yep. I mean, Esri has all that free stuff, like the living Atlas. There's a lot of really cool data that you can get. And really what it is, when, when, when we say, oh, you can do that in a day or whatever, it's muscle memory, right? You've just done it enough. You know your data. You know the path to data. You know how all the attributes, you know. And there's a lot of things you have to know to be that fast. Um, I would never expect someone who is new to be, even, even as a GIS developer, to be as fast as this person who's been there for, you know, seven years. They know everything about the organization. So I think that's what I would do. I would, I mean, I would go learn survey one, two, three and dashboards. And especially with dashboards, especially with just how popular they've become in mainstream media these days. Um, I'm always shocked when people are like, oh, look at this dashboard. And it's just like a regular news station showing off their Esri dashboards. And that was never really a thing before. Like, yeah, they'd have a map or something, but now they're actually using GIS technology so much. It's really cool to see that. Isn't it so cool? I get really excited in the geekiest way possible. And my I'm husband, who like, also works in IT, is always just like, you need to calm down a bit there. <laughs> I will like email to people. I'm like, this is what I do, guys. This is what I do. And they're like, okay, we still don't care. <laughs> I, I love it. It's, it's, I mean, literally today I saw a news article with a Esri dashboard in it. And I was like, I cannot believe I'm seeing this in mainstream media every day. It's pretty cool. Yeah. All right. So I don't want to wrap this up too quickly, but I'm going to finish up with uh, three questions. So it's going to be, what was your favorite project that you work on what was your least favorite project that you worked on and what would be your dream position either you've already done it or you haven't attained it yet my least favorite mm -hmm. and i'm gonna be general it's <laughs> that's fair <laughs> my least favorite projects are always when i have to work with people who <laughs> do not know what they're talking about and have no, don't have the, are not humble enough or self-aware enough to realize that. <laughs> yeah. I think a lot of people can sympathize with those kind of projects. <laughs> yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, like we have the best job ever. Mm -hmm. um, and I never want to complain because like, seriously, our job is so cool, but there is nothing worse than working with someone who's a jerk and that's probably universal with every single profession out there. So that's the worst. And I'll just have to, cause you know, I talk too much. One of my favorite lessons with my employees is when someone's a jerk, we talk about it and I'm like, how are, ha have you ever acted like that? You know, do you think that you've ever come across that way to someone? Maybe not in the same way, but maybe you did it a different time. Has that ever happened? And, you know, how can we do that differently? And how, how could we react differently? And I try to use it as a learning experience of like, um, we can't change that person, but we can change who we are and we can check ourselves. Which is really, I'm so glad that you're aware of this because so many people are just not aware of that. They're they just have this mindset of that's the way it is and that's the way it's always going to be. They don't think that they can change or they don't want to change. So I'm really, I'm so excited to hear that, that you, that you take that into account and that you try to pass that on to those that you're working with. 
think about how bad you feel right now. Have you ever done that? Because I'm mm -hmm. sure we probably have, you know, I'm like, let's not do it again. Maybe we can apologize if it was really bad. <laughs> so anyways, favorite project? That's so hard because there's so many cool projects. Well, I think this is too, I'm going to give you two answers um, because one of them is really nerdy and I probably already, I think, talked about it to a nauseating extent, but I love being a part of helping people see how awesome they are and pushing them when they need to be pushed or maybe just allowing them, just giving them permission and seeing that transformation. Um, like with my current team, they are completely different people than they were you know, three, two and a half years ago. And like, to me, I'm like, oh, some of the, some of actually all of them were like thinking about quitting and now none of them are that, that to me is like so amazing. And I'm so proud of that. That's you know? a really cool success story. I love hearing stuff like that. It's just so many people will, will give up really quickly, but that's really cool to hear that you were able to, to help that team turn it around. Yeah. And you know, I'm not taking all the credit for it. Like they, are a huge part of that success. You know, they, yeah. they could have dug their heels in and um, I probably would have tried to fire him, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, but like a, a real answer, it was really, or a techno, a technological answer. It was really cool. Gosh, I have so many that just are popping into my mind. So I'm going to actually, I'm going to actually give you a strange answer and it's partly because okay. um, it sounds like I have time to ramble for a little bit. One of the things we kind of were starting to talk about, and then I probably went off on a tangent. One of the things that I really like about GIS is that it is integrated and it's integrated with other systems in a lot of different ways. And because of that, we have an opportunity to kind of expand our sphere of influence. So in, um, I've worked for planning departments for the majority of my uh, career. And so one of the things that planning departments do is they review plans. It depends on the structure, but a lot of them have building departments as well. And so they take in permits and, you know, review plans and, you know, send them back for approval. And um, there's this whole process involved and you know, planning, they have to go to a county, they have like commissioners and they have planning commissions and they have, you know, all these different boards that they go to and all these different kind of regulations that they have to follow, state statute or their county code. And I know tons of people are like, I'm so bored right now. Why is she talking about this? But GIS is integrated in that permitting system, right? So what in a was lot of really places it is and then a lot more places it's not and it should be. Yes. Yes. I mean, it, it definitely depends on the size of your um, jurisdiction because uh, it, it is not, none of these systems are cheap and that's obviously the same for GIS. A much smaller jurisdiction is going to have less technology available to you. But so working alongside these planners and listening to their, listening to how they can do their jobs and just li literally just sitting back and listening and understanding their process what I was able to do was, first of all, without saying anything, without promising them anything, I was able to kind of hear what they were saying and then go back to my office and like develop something in GIS for them and be like, hey, would this help you with that problem you were talking about the other day? And they're like, oh my gosh, right? The other thing was I started learning about their process and then when they were having trouble with their permitting system or they weren't understanding how something worked, I would, I would end up being kind of this liaison between the IT department and my planners because I was able to speak both languages, which a lot of, that's, a, that's its own job, right? That's a business analyst, right? That's, it's a huge job. And I mean, you're speaking my language right now because that's exactly what I'm doing with my current position. So but, um, but I totally understand that. And, but people don't realize how I mean, if you're in the industry, you probably realize it, but if you're not, you just don't realize how difficult it is for departments to speak to each other, especially if they're already siloed, like this department yep. just does their thing and nobody else knows about it. Yes. Yes. So by learning 
the planner side of things and, and understanding their processes and their terminology and then try, you know understanding having a much better I was able to communicate with IT much more easily because I understand the way they think you know and and I was able to use translate the words the planners were using into their words they would understand it really just made like now right I just made the GIS department even more valuable and, and the reason I bring this up too is because it's, you're opening all of these other doors for yourself. So instead of saying, no, I don't do that because it's not GIS, and this isn't always appropriate, but you know, if you're able to take on something new and learn something new, do it, you know? Because the next thing I know, I'm working directly reporting to the chief innovation officer and I'm learning- Super cool. Um, yeah, yeah. And Especially we're doing- like, as, as a GIS professional, that's- Amazing. And that's the direction that I, I love seeing the industry going into. Yeah, because I couldn't get things done because of all this bureaucracy on top of me. So I went to the, the um, chief innovation officer in the county and I was like, hey, man, do you think you could like reorganize and I GIS could report to you? And he was like, OK. And like literally like three weeks later, it was done. That's amazing. It's, but, it's so great to see that the industry is actually getting that recognition of, hey, we make things happen. We're not just the map people. As much as I love being the map person, we do so much more and we're so much more qualified to do these amazing things. Yeah. And, and like nobody asked me to do it and nobody created like a business analyst position and no one even knew what that was. So but just just do it, you know, do it because it's the right thing and do it because like it, it will pay off. In, in most places. And if it doesn't for you there, you'll be more dynamic and you'll be more interesting when you interview because you'll have a broader base to talk about than just GIS. You can really talk about the integration and the um, communication and the meetings and the, you know, kind of that other aspect, which is what a lot of GIS professionals, as you move up the chain, are lacking. And so when leadership hears you talk about your ability to do that, they're like, oh yeah, this person, we can't let this person go. Yeah. And so then, you know, then we're, I'm doing Six Sigma, we're, you know, doing training on process improvement, you know, it's, and then I'm like, well, I think I want to be a project manager because that's, you know, something I'm really interested in. So now I'm get, they're paying for my training and now I'm a certified PMP and now I'm doing all these other kind of projects. And so kind of, we were talking about, you know, I still don't necessarily know what I want to be when I grow up, which I know was your other question. Mm-hmm. <laughs> not necessarily uh, what you want to be what you grow up but what's what's the dream what's the dream I guess yeah yeah and like I don't I don't know because I'm still learning but um as I learn I'm getting new opportunities and then I'm able to okay that's not what I want or this is more like what I want and 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 so I'm able to you know the next step four years ago, well, probably more like six years ago was way different than what my next step today might be. And part of that is building skills and getting knowledge and understanding yourself and being exposed. And if you're only going to stay in your GIS bubble, you're not going to get all that. Yeah. And so, I mean, I even got to the point where the uh, leadership said, hey, Brandy, we need to build a utility billing system and you're going to lead the project. And I was like, okay, so I don't know anything about utility billing. I don't know anything about building financial. Systems. Knowing what little I do about I'm like, that's not something I want to poke with a stick even. <laughs> right. But you just dove head into that, like head first into that. They said, listen, we need it done. We need it done in eight months and you're the only one who can do it. So go make it happen. And I was like, okay, can, uh, under one condition. And they're like, what? Like, like I have any right to say that. Yeah. <laughs> and I was when like, you get told you're going to do this in eight months and you're like, okay, <laughs> sure. Of course I am. I was like, so I want to pick my team. Mm -hmm. And they were like, okay. And I was like, okay, so I'm going to pick my team and you're going to make sure that their boss, their supervisors can't impede that. And those people are mine. And they're like, yep, you got it. And I'm like, okay. So we got it done. And that's the kind of thing that all that did, well, it did a lot of things, but it provided my team so much credibility. From um, the sense of? We executed a huge project that everybody knew was not GIS. Okay. <laughs> right? So now they're going, 
what else can the GIS team do? We're miracle workers, don't you know? Right. So all that to be said, like, there's been a couple of really cool projects and they're not all GIS. Mm -hmm. I don't like to keep myself in a, that box. You know, as far as like what eventually what I want to do, I think right now, and this has changed so much in even the past like couple of years, I think right now, I think next move would be like IT director or like a chief innovation, innovation officer type role. What draws you to that kind of role? When I look at what I see in organizations is that if the IT department is not successful, nobody in the organization can be successful. Um, they are fundamental to every, pretty much every single important work process in one way or another, whether it's just someone uses a computer or whether it's, you know, maybe they're just using Microsoft 360 or maybe they're using more in-depth, you know, software programs. If that IT department fails, everybody in the organization fails. You don't and realize I, how key of a backbone it is. Yeah. Yeah. And, and what I don't see, um, and this isn't, this isn't, 100% true all across the board, but I don't see a lot of leaders in positions like IT director who can articulate that and sell it and kind of change the organization. You know, it, it, I just see a lot of status quo. I think it's a good thing. I, I, I think, you know, you need your technology to be stable. So, and I think, but I think that becomes crippling because it's like, we need all of these things to stay like, okay, everyone, nothing's broken, stand still. <laughs> <laughs> and I get that because we, we need stability in our services and our servers and our technology and all that stuff. However, on the other hand, I think that the organization almost looks to IT to be innovators. It's critical that they are, but they don't know how to be. So I think, you know, we focus so much on do they have the technical skill, like how much network or how much security, how much of this do they know? And it's like, well, they're not actually doing any of that. It's kind of like the GIS manager. Like I used to be a heck of a lot more technical than I am today. I could go learn it again. Like I could go pick stuff back up. Mm -hmm. But what, like I was saying, when my boss was asking, like we were talking, what you, we were talking about, like what he was looking for, he wasn't looking for the most technical person that applied for that job. He was actually looking for a manager. Yeah. You know? And I think, unfortunately, a lot of the leadership, they don't know what they want in an IT director. So they just go look at the HR description and it's a lot of really technical things. And then they're like, well, why doesn't this work? And it's like, well, that's because you need to hire a leader. Yeah. And we've already we said earlier that what you see on paper is not always what it is. Like you said, when you put a candidate through a test, you saw a completely different side, whether they shown or you saw that this is not the person you need. Right. So it's always better to have, I think, multiple forms of um, multiple forms that you can evaluate them from. Yeah. Multifaceted human beings. Right. And it's like, you know, I shouldn't. I don't need to be the most technical person. I know enough that I'm like, I can help my employees through a bind if they're stuck. Like, oh, I don't know what to do next. I'm like, oh, well, did you try X, Y, and Z? Or did you think of it this way? And they're like, oh, you know, we, get, we all get tunnel vision, you know? Or I might literally have no idea, but I can say, hey, I'm here for you. Anything you need, you just need to ask and it's yours. Tell me what you need, you know? And sometimes that's enough. Well, Brandy, this has been amazing. I'm so glad we got the chance to talk and, and chat and just dig through all this stuff. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was fun. I talked your ear off a little bit. Um, <laughs> can I I'm ask you a question? You can. What do you do at Eurissa? Um, so I'm, well, I'm currently the president of Eurissa, Texas. So right now, everything. <laughs> <laughs> um so I moved from when I first joined there, helping in any way I could. So I started with, we got a newsletter going and then we started, we have our, our monthly webinar series, the, the speaker series that we've been doing for years now. Um, I started helping with that and it was just adding little things here and there. Um, and, and then I found myself as a, 
president of the chapter, which I'm still not sure how that happened, quite frankly. <laughs> Thank you. But it's, it's been, uh, I do a lot. Um, and I'm still learning how to delegate. There's still a lot of stuff I want to just go and do it because that's what I'm used to doing. So I'm still learning how to delegate things properly to people. But we do a lot. <laughs> and we're trying to give more and more out to our members. So, yeah. th- which takes a lot of work to get that stuff off the ground. So, but we're trying to get it done because we're thinking of what are the resources we would like to have when we were at this stage in our careers or even now, what are things that we would like and we want to be able to provide those for our members. Yeah. So there's, there's a lot going on. <laughs> well, I think it's cool. I listen to your podcast and um, I agree if in, if podcasts existed, you know, 20 years ago, I absolutely would have listened. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Not that I won't now, but um, <laughs> it, it, when you're, when you're newer to the, to a career, it's, it's all just so, you know, theoretical. So yeah. making it less so is pretty great. I think it's hilarious though that I started a podcast because I used to be so dead set against podcasts and now I'm all about podcasts. <laughs> I love podcasts. If you need um, recommendations, we can do that offline. All right. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Thanks, Brandy. Thank you so much. It was great talking to you. You too.